You know, I always did art as a kid. You know, I was like the kid in school that would make the poster for brushing your teeth if the teacher asked me to or whatever, you know. Yeah. But I kind of actually like fell out of it for a little while. You know, I'd pierce my ear and get called a fag and, you know, my best friend was gay. And, you know, so like leaving high school was like the best thing that ever happened to me. You know what I mean? Because I just got to be like my own person and not have to deal with like getting bullied and all that other stuff, you know. So I started doing art a lot more once I had left high school. And I was like really interested in punk rock and you know I had always wanted to move to San Francisco because I would come to Berkeley and Haight Street and just was so turned on by it. I saw like beautiful people, I saw I saw European city style. I saw people that were just liberal thinking. I saw freedom, you know. So I always knew that I'd be here. The first time I ever heard of Freddie Corbin, I was a kid and I was just kind of getting into tattooing, just kind of breaking out in it and meeting some of the older guys. And there was this uh, magazine write up and it just said, Mr. Nice Guy, right on the front, you know? And I remember seeing it and being like, man, who's this little skinny guy, you know? Like, this guy kills it. Even before I got to know Freddie, if somebody asked me, hey, I'm going to go up to the Bay Area. You know, I want to get like a rad black and gray tattoo while I'm up there. I'd be like, well, you got to go to Temple Tattoo and get tattooed by Freddie Corbin. He took what he knew from learning from these old schoolers and brought some black and gray twist on it. He made, I don't know, man, he made a mark. It's hard to describe. It's not even really, like I said, it's Freddie Corbin style. I had never seen anyone do a Day of the Dead skull until Freddie. When I saw him, I was like, oh, it's those little like candy sugar skull things, like as a tattoo. I think he definitely brought that kind of style to tattooing. That style of doing sugar skulls has been copied so many times that kids these days have no idea where it came from. I mean, I will say that I saw a painting of one that Malone did before I ever did one. So Malone probably had done one or two. And Scott Sylvia also was kind of doing them simultaneously, simultaneously. So I think it'd be safe to say, you know, as egotistical as it might sound, only because you asked the question, yes. that Scott and I might have started the Day of the Dead thing. Craze, skull, sugar skull craze. But who knows? You know, I never got really caught up in like having a thing. I eventually got known for like doing religious tattoos and stuff, but I love doing lettering and black and gray tattoos. I love that whole East LA Chicano look. You know, I love Old English next to Jesus's, next to Guadalupe's and big low rider cars. And I, I just love that stuff, you know. He does a lot of stuff that I love to watch him tattoo. I really, really like when he's about to start like some big lettering thing. I don't think people really get what a craft that is to be able to do lettering that good. Watching him write something out, like there's times where I'm like, dude, I'm having trouble with this name. Like, would you help me out? And in just one pass, he'll write the most like beautiful name you've ever seen. Like he's just so good with it. It's unbelievable. Basically, I was fortunate enough to work with a guy named Hollywood, Mark, and um, in Amsterdam, and he had gone to school with Cartoon. They had gone to like graphic art school together. And he taught me a lot of tricks. I mean, there's probably so many kids and tattooers out there right now who don't even know who Freddie Corbin is. He was the young guy, but now he's become the older generation. He's been doing this for 27 years or something crazy. Like, he is that guy now that like, people pay respect to and have love for and show it. Back then, you know, you kind of had to be half a cowboy to get into the business. You know, tattoo shops kind of drew a weird type of folk, you know what I mean? And, and it was a weird type of folk that was, that was drawn to tattooing, especially with the stigma behind it, you know? So you were pretty much embracing an outcast culture. We were all outcasts. No way. You wanna hop up? Yeah. 
Let me, let me look at them if you just stand real natural, real straight. I think they look even. I always just was trying to be just a good tattooer. I look at tattooing like any trade, just like being a plumber or a shoemaker or whatever. I just want to be good at it. I just want to own a shop that's going to be an institution of good tattooing. So people can come and know that no matter who's working there that day, that they'll get a solid tattoo, they'll get treated with respect, and they'll leave happy. That's, that's my goal. Freddie has two shops, Temple and 13, and Temple is the original one. And going to Temple is like, you know, you walk in and you're like, ooh, Temple, you know, like, this is a place. This is gnarly. It's like a cool place to be. It took me a while, like I basically had to postpone it a year. I tried opening up in 97, couldn't get a place, so I put it on hold and came back and then got, got in 98 opened up Temple Tattoo. Now it's me, just me, Heath Priam, Jason McAfee, and Chummy Alexanian works there part time. Jason McAfee, I met through tattooing him. He's just a super solid dude. You know, we just kind of clicked. And I asked him to come cover while I went to Japan, that first Tokyo convention. And he randomly called me. And like, I almost had a heart attack in the shop. You know, we all did. Like me and Chops and Kelly Krantz and all these guys were like, the fuck, how come Freddie Corbin called you? I'm like, I don't know, I met him once. And I was like, oh my God, like, it was meeting, you know, some famous rock star or something for me at that time, because I was just so obsessed with tattooing. And he gave me that for my birthday a couple years ago, which is from a Tattoo Time book. It's the original. And it was such like a weird emotional thing because like I looked at that piece of flash forever and ever and ever since I was a kid. And then to like be holding it and have it was just like, oh my God. I got the Tattoo Time books and that's how I first heard about Freddie Corbin. They're the old books that Ed used to put out on tattoos and stuff, and I was like probably 16. I would look at them and see pictures of Freddie's tattoos in there. Something just attracted me to the Freddie ones. You know, he's also like the first young dude. To see like this young guy with all these old guys pop up and just be like this little ghetto like Nick Cave kind of dude, like cool hair and he had diamonds in his teeth and like Mexican style frames. Hey, how you doing Freddie? You know, he was just like a sharp looking dude. He wore like cool jean vests with like Jesus on them and, and he drove like cool old cars and that just wasn't really happening. That's like one of those names, like when's the first time you heard Chevrolet? Like I think I heard these like older punker girls say Freddie Corbin. And it was like one of those names when you heard it where you're like, man, that's a cool name. Like that dude must be cool. And that's how it has been to this day. Yeah. Oh, first time since 94. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole time you had that Crown Vic, that was just going for it. Any car I had, I was yeah. just going for it. That's why I'd only drive beaters. Wow. You know? He's one of those dudes that just has that thing. We, you or I might walk into the room and be like, did you hear I had a kid? Did you hear I got my face tattooed? Yeah. Freddie, he just walks into the room and that's who he is. And you kind of have to be like, has he always had that fucking tattoo on his face? You know, he's just fucking cool. Especially today, you see all these people with face tattoos and neck tattoos, and it's like, oh, my indie band got signed, you know? I'm only 21, but I'm just gonna get my neck tattooed. And it, with Freddie, he's been around this for so long that he just wears it well. You know, there's no one else that can wear a face tattoo like Freddie Corbin. You know, I've never thought about it right now, but I can't picture him as a kid. like a. 14 year old or 16 year old like in school reading Catcher in the Rye like he's just always been slick back hair tattoos like how you doing bro hey bro bro is a gross word when most people say it when he says it you're like oh yeah bro thanks for the 
birthday vacation oh, of working here. Sure, dude. I, yeah. I told him the smartest thing he did is fucking stay home. Yeah. At home vacations are the way to go. That's been nice. Get shit done. It's funny because, you know, Jason McAfee's like one of my best friends and I go by 13 every day. Like it's on the, just my route. That, and, I, and Freddie lives by 13, so that's why I see him. <laughs> can, yeah, can, can I ask you, uh, how do you feel about this neighborhood being gentrified? <laughs> we need more marijuana. <laughs> yeah, we do. I hear that, brother. <laughs> Huh, Sonny? Never trust our government, Sonny. Never. <laughs> never get the chip. Never trust the president. 13 is a real fucking tattoo shop. Everyone's good that works there, but they're all fucking just fuck-ups that tattoo, and it's rad. Freddie's smart enough just to hire dudes that want to work, dudes that like to party, because I think that's important in tattooing, you know? Like, you know, they used to have Friday the 13th parties and you get these $13 tattoos. Freddie did a 13 on my butt, you know, as a joke. But that's my only Freddie Corbin tattoo. I, I was drunk and you leave there like, God, who's gonna fucking clean this up? What's Freddie gonna think? Freddie's gonna walk in there and go like, I've uh, done that a thousand times, bro. Did you guys have a good time? <laughs> hey, next time don't uh, let someone sit on my chair or whatever, you know, it's just gonna be that simple. I'm not really their boss, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm their friend, you know, and I just happen to be their boss. You know, it was just kind of a free for all for a while because, you know, like I was saying, we're all kind of like brothers, you know? So nobody wants to like rat out their brother. And when it comes down to it, I mean, you know, what I say goes and they all give me that respect and they're all wonderful about that. It's almost like I've had to say, you know, okay, if you're not gonna come in, you have to call me and tell me because no one's gonna rat you out, you know what I mean? I need to know what's going on. I'm not gonna be mad, but I, got, I kinda gotta need to know because there's been times where, you know, someone will say, oh, I wanna go down, or I'll go to send somebody up to 13 because we're busy. That's another reason why I opened, is kinda be our own competition. Tattoo 13, it was basically like a guerrilla move, you know? It was kind of like I knew that this neighborhood was gonna blow up. And I knew that I actually tried to open up in this neighborhood, but nobody would rent to me. They opened it up about a year and a half after I opened up uh, Temple. It was premature. I knew that it was premature, but I just went for it, you know? And it worked out really well. I'm glad I didn't listen to anybody. <laughs> okay. I mean, our economy's fucked right now, but they're tattooing every day there. Jason's got a kid and an ex-wife and you know, he, he's got to handle his business and still party and have a good time. And he can do that working for Freddie. Freddie opened Temple 13 years ago. So Jason was there from the beginning. Like I've seen this shop go through so many insane changes. It's, it's pretty nuts. I mean, Freddie was the first white guy on this whole block. And when I first started working here, everyone thought I was him. I would go to the store and they'd be like, Freddie, what's up? And I was like, well, I'm not Freddie. He just popped up in the middle of this area and people were just like, what the fuck? You know, I mean, downtown Oakland used to be totally different. So this is actually after we had been open and the windows got busted out from the protest from Oscar Grant getting shot. I tell someone next to me on the airplane, like, I'm from Oakland. Oh, God. You know, that's what everyone thinks of Oakland. He could have opened a shop in San Francisco. Man, I get like choked up thinking about him making that decision just because like Oakland means so much to me, but he chose to open a shop downtown. That neighborhood, when he did it, was way cutty. You know, we'd skateboard there on weekends because there's no businesses down there. No one wants to be down there. There's no reason to be down there. I mean, I don't want to say it was a huge ghetto, you know what I mean? But, you know, it was just like, crackhead heaven so you know there isn't really like a reason to come over you know what i mean um but i had worked in so many like kind of lower income areas and was cool with that plus i knew it just made sense that with san francisco blowing up the way it was just like manhattan people just have to migrate east like the Weed places and all that shit are there now because of him or just because, you know, someone had to pave the way. And Freddie was just the dude that 
man, it probably was the price, probably how the space was shaped. He knew he could fit everyone in there, but you know, had enough foresight to say, this is the spot. This is some early uh, temple, uh, temple tattoo, Oakland tattooing. Fuck the world, I'm a killer. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> this was this little crip kid that I had covered up BK on and put his family's names on him and stuff like that. You know, even though I'm not really into violence or whatever, I just love that whole East LA like gangster imagery, you know. I've always been really, really attracted to it. And that's why I've always really liked working in places like Philly or Oakland or Sacramento where there's like a bunch of kids from the hood getting tattooed. I could do tattoos like that all, all, all day for weeks and not be bummed out about it at all, you know? Anywhere there's a low income area, you do it. You know, you do pit bulls, you do grim reapers, you do cash money maker, you know, you do money simp signs, fuck the world, you know, the world with the fuck you finger busting out of it. And, you know, Playboy Bunny rings, shit like that, you know, I just think it's hilarious. So I, I love doing it too. It's cool shit. <laughs>